Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is our 100th episode, our 100th episode of the Fisherman's Post Podcast Series, and it is titled Jigging for African Pompano. We've brought in one of our favorite guests, Captain Rick Croson of Living Waters Guide Service out of the Wrightsville Beach area, and we are going to be covering such areas as general characteristics, seasonal habits, where to look, and how to target. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and here in our latest and greatest effort, the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series, where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their thoughts, their knowledge, their insights on how to catch more fish more often. In this endeavor, I'm joined just as I am in every episode, all 100 episodes, by Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. Billy, welcome to number 100. Here we go. <laughs> there I am. Awesome. So on episode number 100, I decided, you know what, let's just change software and just go at it uh, with blind so here we are and it's working pretty good man so i'm excited about episode number 100 um it is a treat to be doing these podcasts with you man so 100 that's a big deal that's a lot of shows now that i think about it it is isn't it i mean we yeah. we're killing it aren't we i don't even know if we're... i've done anything for a hundred of anything before <laughs> so i feel accomplished just in life general you know and i, I mean i Whatever. Anyway, I'm not getting any better at it either, as you can tell. So that's it's plus. I still have maybe a hundred more, and I'll be okay, be able to carry on a conversation. But anyway, yeah, man, got got Rick on. That's gonna be fun. If this show is half as good as the Bree show, it's gonna be the most entertaining show we've <laughs> put out yet. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, man. So I'm excited. And then Marine Warehouse Center has been with us for 95 of these episodes. Man, they have really for whatever reason, got on here and stuck with these two knuckleheads and put their logo beside of us, which we appreciate. Very though. grateful. Very <laughs> grateful for their support. And again, as we've said repeatedly, like not only that, not only since episode five, but they reached out to us and said, yeah. man, we really like what you guys got going on. We want to support it. We want to be a part of it. We didn't even make that sales call, man. They called us. And that again, I think speaks to their involvement, their support of the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. You know, Absolutely, man. Happy to be married with them. Absolutely. Well, and I want to talk about our other sponsor real quick, too, and then I'll show you a video from Marine Warehouse, but Bland Landscaping Co. Uh, so they came on. They also reached out to us and said, hey, we want to support the show. We love what you guys are doing, um, and we are outdoors men and women, uh, and they are looking for people to come on to their team that enjoy the outdoors and – um, yeah, I want to get go to work early, get off work early, all those fun things, Gary. So be sure if you're looking for a new job, new career, not really just a job, a new career, uh, and go spend a hundred something with them. Probably not a hundred years, but maybe like hundred months or something. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Go do something. If you want a new career, go over to Bland Landscaping. Uh, dot com slash careers and see what they have in store for you. Uh, and this is my hundredth episode, so I may retire from this and go work for those guys. Huh. All right. <laughs> yeah. Gary, here's all this tech crap. You can deal with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm over it. <laughs> Ooh. Gary's like, can I uh, draw pictures of the, of my face and talk? <laughs> yeah, man. Bland landscaping again, fits that bill. Like I, I like their vibe. I like what they're about, man. They're a good fit for the podcast, for our yeah. podcast community. I mean, good place, good organization, good people like-minded as you point out repeatedly when you're doing your plugs, and uh, I, I think that I think that relationship makes a lot of sense too, man. Yeah, man, absolutely. Really appreciate those guys. And now back to Marine Warehouse again. We're giving them some extra love on 100 episode 100. I got a quick word from them, and we'll be back. Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats. We have parts. We have accessories. New trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. There you go, Gary. Great operation, man. 
you know, uh, as I pointed out last episode, they, uh, they are working on my boat. They are getting the fish post boat ready for another season, paint in the bottom, full service. And uh, I will be going into the season with confidence because that's what you want, man. You want to turn the key and go. Time on the water is precious. Time on the water with family, with friends, fishing, whatever it is, it's precious. And you do not want to turn that key and not be pulling away from the dock. So I'm happy Absolutely. to have that relationship, you know, happy that they take care of the fish post boat. Absolutely, man. We love those guys. And speaking of being more efficient and spending time on the water, uh, we announced in our last episode that we are having, we do have a membership available. So it's going to be weekly fishing reports brought to you by Fisherman's Post. And we're going to be doing audio and video. It's a, it is a membership base. All the, the information is in the show notes, show description. Uh, so we do have a goal to hit that, to launch that in April. So if you want to be a part of that, Go click that link and uh, go learn some more information, become part of our membership group. And we do have special pricing for charter members, Gary. So I'm pretty excited to be talking about that again. You did a great job on the last episode of promoting it. And you guys probably, if you follow us, have seen some more information out there as well and some more videos and all that stuff. So I won't spend too much time on it. Maybe we'll talk about it at the end, but just wanted to plug that in there as well, Gary. Yeah, man. Weekly fishing reports, returning to Fisherman's Post, available behind a paid wall at fishermanspost.com starting in April, inshore only. Again, this is a new project for us. We got to walk before we can run and uh, charter membership special available right now. And you can lock in that rate for life as long as you just keep renewing. You got this special one time rate. Yeah, man. Awesome, dude. Well, it's going to be good. I'm, I'm excited to have you and Rick. You guys are always a good time. So we'll see what comes of this episode. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. He's easy to talk to. And, you know, when we were brainstorming on a guest for the 100th episode, man, he made he made a lot of sense and wanted to bring him in to be a part of this. You know, one of our favorite guests. And yeah, uh, yeah man. So your job is Billy's best takeaway. Your job is to listen to the insight he's going to share about African Pompano. And, you know, you and I'll come back together. But, yeah, yeah man, we're going to set Rick yeah. up to do his thing. Well, and and you guys are friends. So that's the little story I told you before the show. I, I don't expect that to come up again, okay? So appreciate <laughs> it you. will not. <laughs> I mean, right. Rick, I can't speak for Rick. He's a grown man, but I will not be bringing it up. I'm just messing. All right, here you go, Gary. I'll talk to you guys later. Right on. Well, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show one of our favorite guests, Hello, Captain Rick Croson, Living Waters Guide Service out of Wrightsville Beach. How you doing tonight? Hey, good night, Gary, or afternoon, Gary. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing yeah. good, man. I'm Happy so to be talking to you. To you. Um, to African Pompano is kind of a specialty fish, I guess. I mean, I'll, I'll let you describe it, but uh, looking forward to talking to you. But it doesn't matter our history. It doesn't matter how many times you've been a guest on the show. No one proceeds without the two questions. So when you say you're ready for question number one, that is what you will receive. Question number one. Go. Why should we listen to anything you have to say about an African pompano? <laughs> That's a great question, Gary. <laughs> and um, other than I've caught a bunch of them, and I like to, uh, I like to think that I'm uh, pretty good at putting my clients on them. Uh, I don't know that there's any reason you should listen to me. <laughs> well, good at catching them putting clients on them, you know, you've got an easy path. Um, question number two, I think I've done a better job with question number two in the past, but you know, oh, well, I've been a little busy lately. So here's, here's what I came up with. <clears throat> you know, those African pompano, they look like angry fish, man. They kind of got that eyebrow and they look like angry fish. And that eyebrow reminds me of angry birds, the angry birds character. So your question has to do with angry birds. Are you ready? Okay. I'm going to give you a list of four types of birds. You tell me which angry bird type is made up. Are you ready? Okay. Sneezy bird, funny bird, grouchy bird, clumsy bird. Which is the made up bird? Grouchy bird. You're correct. That's why um, you should listen to me. So is Clumsy Bird. I, I kind of stacked the deck in your favor. I gave you two that you could have gotten right. But apparently in Angry Bird world, Sneezy and Funny are real. And then Grouchy and Clumsy are uh, Smurfs. I, I looked up Smurfs and said, what are some Smurf names? But enough of non-fishing jibber-jabber. 
man, let's talk about African Pompano. You want to just begin again. I think it is especially fish. Not many people are overly familiar with it. So I like that in our show notes, you say, man, let's just talk about general characteristics, man. Let's introduce the fish to the audience. Yeah. So African Pompano, um, again, I, I talk about being very, very blessed in, uh, in our latitude. Um, we have an amazing, um, uh, just uh, our, our ocean is amazing in our latitude. We have a really, really slow sloping uh, coastline. Uh, it takes 60 miles to get to the edge of the continental shelf uh, or what we call the Gulf Stream. Um, and when there's a ton of bottom, uh, natural bottom and artificial bottom between zero and 60 miles. Um, and we're also at a latitude where we're the northern and southern range for most animals. Um, and luckily for us, African pompanos um, don't really get much past um, hatteras. Um, and we have them year round. They do migrate inshore, offshore and north and south. Um, but we're just really blessed to have this incredible fish um, year round. Um, they do move around a lot and they're frustrating animals to, to kind of target and get good at catching. Um, but I have some tricks I can, I'm going to show you. Um, uh, so, you know, as, as far as like basic physiology of an African pompano, um, they are um, temperate ocean fish, meaning that they want to be in conditions where it's 70 degrees uh, or warmer. Um, they're okay being in really, really warm water. Um, really, really cold water, they migrate offshore to get away from it. Um, as far as what they eat, um, they eat squid, they eat fishes, they eat crustaceans. Um, they do have an angry look about them and they have a really large mouth. Um, so they can, they can eat all kinds of different things, uh, which again, makes them frustrating to figure out. Um, they, uh, they don't mind uh, being in the deep. Uh, they really don't like to be past 250 to 300 feet, but I've caught them as deep as 400. Um, I've never really caught them shallower than 80 foot, but I'm sure that they are in shallower water than that. Um, but, you know, in general, it's a fish that um, we have all, all the time. In the summertime, they scatter out on all the bottom that's in Anzo Bay. In the wintertime, they migrate off to the continental shelf. And uh, so we're going to talk about them in seasons uh, here in a minute, um, because that's how you kind of have to uh, approach where to go find them. Okay, man. So a year round fish, but they do move around and 80 feet to 400 feet. I mean, I, it's, it is an intriguing fish and I didn't know their diet. So it is a wide variety of diet. And I don't even think I'd really noticed you know, that they had a big mouth. I think I just sort of look at their big profile and, you know, again, that what seems to be almost like an eyebrow type delivery of, you know, over the eye. Um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm in on this fish. Like, you know, so what is, where, where do we go from here, man? I, I, I want to know how to target these. Yeah. So you and me are actually on a trip one time. Uh, it was you, me, Max and Eddie long time ago. And uh, Max caught one in the dead of summer offshore. We were bottom fishing in, in like 180 foot. He caught one on a squid, dead squid, and Max caught one, or uh, Eddie caught one on a uh, whole Boston mackerel, um, and, and and that kind of that that kind of shows their diet range. Um, I feel like they're um, they'll eat whatever's available at the time. Um, a lot of people catch them during the summer as bycatch while king mackerel fishing or live bait fishing um, because their downriggers are down mid water column. And, and they just, uh, you know, they'll eat whatever is available. So when you troll by a piece of structure with them on there and um, they see your menhaden down there, 30, 40, 50 foot, then, you know, they'll smoke and eat it. Um, the one thing I'll say about an African pompano first to kind of to kind of give it a broad general statement, I regard them as one of the best fighting fish we have. They have a tail like a king mackerel. They have the big broad body like a permit or, or an amberjack. And they have a big mouth. They don't have any teeth, uh, so they're they're swallow feeders. They're not um, ram feeders, meaning they're not going to take a bait and try to cut it in half to stop it and then come back around. They're going to swallow um, whatever they're trying to eat. Um, so that helps with some of the target and delivery systems we're going to use to target them. Um, mm -hmm. 
so my question is, um, what did I catch my African Pompano on on that trip? We talked about Max and Eddie, but I, I didn't make that list. I mean, uh, certainly you were a good enough captain to put us all on one, but I just can't remember what I caught mine on. Gary, I'm a great, I'm a great captain, but but sometimes helping out my clients is harder than <laughs> nothing against Eddie? you. Eddie I, caught one and I didn't. I think you caught one on a jig uh, the next trip. <laughs> all right, deal. Let's go on. All right, so so um, all right, so general characteristics. Um, here here's and this is just me. I'm an OCD kind of person, so I love to study these animals. Um, and if you've ever been to the to the aquarium, any big aquarium, um, there are fish that do this characteristic. Um, pompanos are not loner fish. They're school type fish. That doesn't have to be a big school. They can be in schools of say six to 10, 12 fish or as big as a couple hundred. But one of the things they do is they don't sit on the bottom like a grouper and they don't uh, patrol the top like a, like a wahoo or a barracuda or a mahi. They do this midwater game. Okay, they're the best. And what they do is when they get in these little schools is they go round and round and round in a circle. And if you've ever been to the aquarium and you've seen fish in the big tank, they'll be in a group and you'll see them start at the bottom of the tank and they'll make a circle and they'll go up and then they go back down. And they're kind of in their little circle. That's what pompanos do. They have a giant eye and that eye is out to the side kind of it's actually going downward. So as they're circling around, their their periphery is huge. Um, and, and when they start seeing bait or when they see commotion, the whole school can kind of, you know, all migrate towards that area while staying in that formation. Um, so one of the things you'll see when you start to figure out how to catch them is, um, especially if there's four or five people fishing or jigging at a time, is you'll get multiple hookups because those fish are on a big school together. Okay. So um, if you see somebody hook up, drop another bait down if they're not, if you're not already fishing, because um, you want to take advantage of knowing where they are for one and, and being, getting a bait where they are and, and trying to get as many bites as you can, because they do move around a little bit. Um, let's talk about seasonal habits. Um, since I was talking about how they like 70 degree water and warmer. Um, so for me, since I basically fish the Gulf Stream or offshore waters, um, for me, I target them fall, winter, and spring, um, meaning that in the fall, around, uh, say, the middle of October, as everything starts to cool on the beach, they start moving offshore to get to where the water temperature is consistent all the time. And um, typically, that is um, 140 to 250 foot of water. Okay. Um, they stay there all winter. And they stay there all spring until, again, after, you know, say um, mid to late April, as the water starts to warm up on the, in, in the Gulf Stream and push inshore, they follow that water and they follow the bait inshore. All the way to, say, 80 foot of water in, in a general, you know, when you're thinking of how to target them, think 80 foot and deeper. And the, the problem with them in the summertime is they literally come inside and they're everywhere. They're on big pieces of structure. They're on little pieces of structure. They're on wrecks. They're on live bottoms. Um, and they're not in giant schools. They're in, um, like I say, six to 12 fish, you know, little packs. Um, in the wintertime and, and, and in the fall, they start to gang up offshore and they get thicker and thicker and thicker. And in the winter, they're in big giant schools. So when you find them, you might find 100 to 300 fish. Um, and then as the spring comes along and they start to migrate in, obviously those schools get smaller and smaller. Okay. So um, for the general discussion tonight, let's, let's kind of focus on them all being in the deep, say 150 foot and deeper. Um, and the techniques we're going to use, um, we call it jigging. Uh, vertical jigging is very, very effective. Uh, I'm also going to show you a bucktail and I'm also going to show you a little squid imitation. Um, you, Basically, what you have to do to catch African pompanos is find them. Um, so they live on structure. They don't live over sand. Um, and so what you have to do is when you in the fall, winter, and spring, is you have to go offshore to where you find 70-degree water uh, or warmer, um, or call it 68 and warmer on the surface, and start looking for structure. Okay. 
Now I took a picture of my of my uh, bottom machine <clears throat> when I marked them this last uh, couple years ago, and I wanted to show this to you. So this is a this is a hump just offshore, uh, or excuse me, just inshore of the break. So we're in like 160 foot of water here. Okay, right before the first big break of the continental shelf. And what I'm showing you is this is a piece of rock, and there's some structure here. You see a little bit of live stuff growing. You see a little bit of live stuff growing, and you see some bait and some stuff. And a lot of this is amberjacks and other stuff and bait, you know, tom tates and ringtails and just all kinds of stuff, little reef fish, okay? These marks here, those two little marks there, those eyebrows, those are African pompanos on my machine. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because the way you have to find them is you go to a, a piece of structure and you drift over it or you slow troll around it or you troll over it until you find marks that you think could possibly be African pompanos. And then the trick is how to get them, you know, entice them to bite, which is we'll talk about that in a second. How to find them, though, they're on structure, always on structure. Um, I don't think I've ever caught one over sand. You know, some fish you can catch over sand um, going from structure to structure because there's bait or food or whatever, a color change, um, a grass line, a, you know, whatever. African pompaners are not that way. Um, they are structure oriented. And when they move from structure to structure, they don't eat, you know, so you need to go find some structure, look for the pompanos and then show, you know, do all the tricks that we're going to show you here in a second. I got a question. Yes, sir. So in that screenshot, man, that didn't look like middle of the water column, man. That looks like more they're hanging at the bottom. Is it, yeah. I mean, so in this shot, what you're seeing is, um, they're in their, they're in the downward cycle. So like I'm saying, they, they'll cycle up and then they'll cycle back down. Okay. And so this is, this is the bottom of their cycle. Um, and you know, you'll notice that this piece, so I cut off, I cut off the side so you couldn't see the depth, but this rock is 20 feet. So they're a good 30, 40 feet off the bottom. Okay. Yeah. I should have left that on here so you could see the depth, but um, there I'd say they're at least 30 to 40 feet off this, off this rock. Now, with that said, I told you that their eyes are kind of facing downward and they're giant. Their tendency to eat once they, once you do get a bait in front of them is to go downward to eat. Okay. So we typically catch them from the bottom, like literally dragging or, or, or bouncing the bottom up, say halfway through the water column. Now I'm, I'm sure I've hooked them higher than midway mid water column, but targeting them again from the bottom up halfway. So if I'm in 150 foot from zero to 75 foot is where I'm going to stay. And from really for me from zero to 50 foot is where I'm going to stay in that scenario. If I get to 200 foot, I may, I may fish up to 75 or 80 foot and then go back down. Um, the, the, with the way their eyes are, they're they're looking around and they see stuff, but they can they can attack the the bait by going down, not up. Okay, I mean I I follow all that. I mean and all that makes sense. And so when you're on an African pompano trip, though, you're really not dropping until you see something on the machine that gives you confidence. You're not blind dropping just to test the waters for. It depends. It's a great question. It depends. So. Um, if I'm on a big piece of bottom, meaning that I can make a long drift, um, what I'll typically do is, um, if I have time, I'll kind of circle around and see where the, the most, um, uh, action is, let's call it action. Um, I'm going to look for bait. I'm going to look for, you know, amberjack marks. I'm going to look for any kind of fish life on that structure area. And that's kind of where I'm going to start. Um, Pompanos, like a lot of fish, um, when they're not feeding, their their uh, swim bladders are not inflated because they're just maintaining themselves. So they're just literally maintaining themselves and they're going up and down in a spiral, but they're not they're not actively trying to chase anything. Um, when they get excited and they start to feed, that's when their their uh, physiology changes and they show up differently on your graph. So um, you'll notice that as you're drifting along and you're drifting you're, and you're jigging and you do hook a couple fish, you'll mark them and all of a sudden the marks will get bigger and bigger and bigger. There'll be more of them and your next pass, they'll, they'll stay excited. Um, that's kind of another way to know that they're pompanos. 
Um, jacks will do it too, but if they're jacks, a lot of times you'll catch them right away. Africans sometimes they'll uh, they'll be picky, so you they'll get excited, but they won't eat right away. Um, and that's when you start changing your lures and changing your techniques. Um, that's also when it helps if you have four or five or six guys fishing at a time because everybody can start off doing something different. And typically, once you get that first bite, um, that's what they want. Um, whether it's a long jig, whether it's a short jig, whether it doesn't matter what the jig is, but it matters that it's on the bottom or whether it's up in the column or if it's going a little faster or a little slower. Um, every once in a while, you'll find a color preference, but not they're typically not color specific. They're more shape and, and action specific. Um, and, and I like to target them over really big areas offshore. So um, there are some places straight off of uh, Wrightsville Beach, um, you know, from, say, say from the same old, uh, which is a, a big known place, there's some structure right in shore of that. Um, the same old itself is kind of deep. It gets to 3, 325, and I've caught some out there, but that's not where I would target them. I would target them just inside of that, in that 140 to 200 foot range. So on that, if I'm following you correctly, on that screenshot you showed me, it's not that those are the two African pompano that it's on the structure. Those are the two excited pompano that are on that structure and that there's likely more African pompano there. They're just not showing up as eyebrow marks because they're not engaged. They're more just in their circular pattern without any kind of energy expulsion. That's right. You nailed it. Huh. That's exactly it. And it sounds crazy. I've been doing this for a long, long time. I stare at my, my bottom machine all day long. That's what I get paid to do is find fish and figure out how to get them to eat stuff. And it sounds crazy, but yes, you're exactly right. If I can, if I have a mark, great. If I have to drift over structure and then move over 50 feet or 50 yards and make another drift and move over 50 yards and make another drift until I get them excited to show up on my screen, that's what I'll do. Um, that's what I had to do Monday. Matter of fact, I fished this past Monday, very rough conditions. Um, Water was kind of blended all together, 70 degrees on the nose, 175 foot of water. And we made long, literally mile long drifts over what I call a patch reef. So there's structure and then some broken bottom and then another piece of structure and then broken bottom and another piece of structure. And um, we had to make really long drifts over and over and over again. And um, we didn't have a pompano bite until noon. And then we had our first pompano bite and it was three. Okay, so it, in, we had three pompano bites. We got two to the boat. The, the whole graph changed. So when I pulled back up, I marked them for a certain amount of time and stopped and made my drift again. And, and that's what we had to do. We just had to keep working the bottom because we knew they were there. We just had to get them fired up so we could actually see them. And, man, that is very intriguing. And, and like, just a quick aside, is, are there – is there another species or two that sort of behave that way as far as showing up on the machine or is African Pompo kind of unique in that characteristic? Well, Amberjack will do that. Uh, any of your, any of your mid water fish that, that, um, that, um, hunt from say a little bit above mid water all the way to the bottom, what they have to do is they have to change their, their body physiology so that they can rapidly go up and down. Um, that's why you know, you've caught a grouper and you've brought him up and he hasn't had a chance to, to change. So he gases out with nitrogen. Um, what they're doing is they're putting nit nitrogen in their bloodstream and, and it fills up what they call what's called an air bladder um, or a swim bladder. And um, it allows them to go up and down without pressure bothering them to, to hunt. Um, so amberjacks, African pompanos, um, Surprisingly, tunas do it, but it's not through a swim bladder. It, it's it's more of a um, I don't know what you call it on a tuna, but it's not it's not through that. It's not a, it's not gas. It's um, a liver change or something. But anyway, um, tunas will do it too to an extent. But they're feeding from the from midwater to the surface, whereas these fish are fish are fighting um, or f hunting from mid to the bottom. So okay. it's a different it's a different kind of change. Right on. I mean, I think that's intriguing, man. I, I mean, I'm not Billy, but that's my best takeaway so far, man. I, I'm, I'm hanging on every word now. Help me hook a fish. Yeah. These, these things are awesome. And I tell, I tell my clients, like if they've never caught one that you know, with the tail of a, of a King mackerel and the body of a, of a Jack, 
Um, you know, they can they can make astonishingly fast runs and they turn sideways and bully you. Um, and and if they jumped or ate a popper, they'd be the perfect fish. Uh, and they also taste like, I mean, they taste like lobster. So it's, it's like, you know, you got to be careful not to kill them all because you want to after you eat the first one. Um, all right. So here's the deal. We've, we've, uh, we've established that we're fishing over the correct piece of bottom and we're going to start off with our lure selection. Now we're calling this vertical jigging or jigging for Pompano. And it's kind of my specialty again is, is hands-on jigging, popping, um, I want you to have a rod in your hand and I'll teach you how to do it. And then you do, you do the work. Um, and so going back to that vertical jigging is exactly what it sounds like. The presentation needs to be as vertical as possible with the exception of, I'm going to show you a bucktail here in a second. And I'm going to show you a squid jig. Um, they can have line angle because you're not working them in an upward manner. Um, like you would these jigs. Um, so what I typically do is we, we have the structure area we, we're going to fish. I, I have everybody, if I have three or four or five guys, everybody starts off with something different. And by that, I mean, we'll start off with long jigs, short jigs, really short jigs, and then a flutter jig. Okay. And what this does is it allows me to find out whether it's, oh, and I'll change colors on everything too. So everybody will have a different color, everybody will have a different shape. And what I want to find out is, um, are they eating on the bottom, in the middle? Is it a length thing? Is, do they want a long jig today versus a short jig? Do they want a jig that has a lot of action? Meaning like, for instance, these two jigs. Okay, this is a Roscoe jig by Blue Water Candy. This is an excellent, excellent jig for holding the bottom. It doesn't have a whole lot of vibration action. Actually, it's designed to when you jig it, it wobbles on the way up, and then it falls dead on the way down. The opposite of this flat jig, it's, it's rounded on one side and it's flat on the other. And what this the jig does is when it shoots, when you jig, it shoots up real fast and then it flutters on the way down. So they're completely opposite jigs. Um, this jig holds the bottom good because as I jig it up, it goes brrr, and it doesn't want to go up, but it wants to go down when the slack hits it. This is the opposite. When I jig it, it goes up fast and comes down slow. So this holds the bottom good. This holds the bottom not as good. If a pompano eats this jig right off the bat and I get two or three bites, everybody's going to this style jig because that means that those fish are focusing on the bottom say 10% of the water column and, and they don't want the distraction of this going up and then wobbling slow and then going up higher. They want it to be coming up, making them commotion so they can feel it or see it and then going back down and staying low. Um, so that's one distinction. I need to know if they're feeding low and then sometimes you'll find, I'll hold these two jigs back up. Sometimes you'll find that they want a long jig over a short jig. Okay. Um, again, I don't find that color makes as much of a difference as the length of the jig or the orientation to where it is in the water column. Um, I do like, and most of the things I've showed you have some glow on them. This is, this is just my favorite color jig, uh, for Pompano's is anyway, um, is it silver and then glow and it just bands back and forth, silver glow, silver glow. And it really lights up the Roscoe jig. Also, the entire body is made of glow paint. So it really has a lot of luminous down on the bottom. So if you're targeting these fish and they're biting on the bottom, so anything with glow on it is going to be better than um, just a shiny reflective pattern like this. This is, again, this is to be used from the bottom up, but up is the key word. And these are designed to be used from the bottom up, but staying lower than, than midwater. Um, okay. And then here's another jig. This is just a, it's a Williamson jig, just to kind of show you some options on stuff that you can get locally in town still. And again, glow paint on the sides. Um, this is a bright chartreuse one that and then glow. Um, I normally like pink glow, you know, glow whites, um, glow blues. Um, and since they eat a variety of fish and, and uh, crustaceans and shrimp, uh, squid, um, Sometimes they'll be color oriented, but most of the time they're, they're more just 
like I say, length of the jig or where it's at in the water column. All right, I got a. I guess my quick question on the follow up on the jigs is, I understand about the action and about the water column, but are any of those jigs? I mean, other than being glow or bright, are they designed to resemble a certain bait fish, resemble a certain forage fish that they're targeting, or is it really just reaction strikes and being visible? Is the game we're playing with those jigs? Oh, it's a great question. So. so some jigs are designed to symbol certain things. Like, you know, obviously this is a mackerel. This is a squid. <laughs> um, so, you know, some jigs are designed to look like specific things. And, and I helped design this jig. And, and the reason that it works as well as it does is because it shoots downward or it wiggles on the way up, so has resistance on the way up, but it goes down real fast. The reason that that looks like a squid and reacts that way is a squid swells up with water and then blows that water out. And he, he does he does the shuddering while he's sucking all the water in, and then he's blowing that water out and going down really fast. Squid motion. Um, this jig shoots up real fast and flutters like a ailing or injured bait fish. They move fast going forward. If they get hit or struck or, or are injured, then they flutter as they, you know, trying to you know, figure out what's going on or, you know, cut their tail off or whatever. So this is more of a fish pattern. Um, so, yes, jigs do – their action mimics different things. I'll show you this too. Um, this is a, a barefoot squid um, on a barefoot head. It, it, it mimics a squid, obviously, and it's soft plastic bait um, with a head that's designed as a jig. So when you jig it, it actually goes – instead of going upwards, it goes side to side like this. Um, and if you're looking, if you've ever seen squid in, in slow motion as they're going by, if you look at them in real time, all you see is a blip go by the screen. They're, they're sucking water and blowing out water as fast as you can imagine. It's just, and they're gone. So you see them as streaks across the screen. Most people don't even know what they are. Uh, I've taken my videos and gone down frame by frame to see what they are because of, I see it all the time out in the deep. And so, um, you know, we have a ton of squid offshore. A lot of times that's what everything eats. Um, if there was a big school of sardines on that piece of bottom and those uh, African pompanos get on them, they have a high fat content. So they know that, hey, look, I can eat one sardine or I can eat 10 squid. What's what's more beneficial for me? Um, but they're not going to – I don't think they'll – most of the time you'll find out that they're going to eat one pattern or the other. Um, again, um, that makes them frustrating to, to figure out. Um, once you do figure them out, usually catching them is really easy. Um, some tricks that we also do as far as the jig goes, um, this is an assist hook setup. Um, so it's just like me jigging for tunas or jigging for any other, um, any other species, bottom fish up. This is an assist hook setup. So it's got the, the hooks at the top and, um, it's a piece of Kevlar. Um, there's a solid ring and a split ring up here. And so your lines here, and as you're jigging the hooks going up and down, um, I like them to be bare because now the hook doesn't influence the jig. The jig motion is all on its own. The hook just kind of goes out of the way as it's fluttering or shooting down. Um, the other advantage of having a hook set up like this is um, the weight of the jig doesn't matter to the fish. When the fish goes to eat, since the hook doesn't weigh anything, the hook can go in his mouth, you know. And so as he's swallowing water, the hook's going in. That gives you a better um, hookup ratio and gives you a better chance to get a more – uh, deep hook set and pompanos have a big mouth again another problem with pompanos is because if they're not feeding super aggressively and they swallow enough water to get your jig and the jigs heavy the hook doesn't go that far in their mouth you hook them in the in the skin of their lips and they're so strong as you're fighting them you tear that skin off and then they go free that's what happened monday a, a ton we those fish every fish we caught was barely skin hooked and so you have to fight them hard. We have a lot of sharks out there, and it's a strong animal, but there's nothing you can do when they're not biting it really well. Um, so that's the that's the assist hook setup that I really I prefer on all my jigs. But pompano specifically, uh, sometimes we'll add um, this this stuff to it. Like this is a, a an owner. Um, uh, it's an assist hook with uh, um, like flashaboo on it. Kind of looks like a feather. Um, and then I made these, this is just two different assist hooks and I added a squid over top of my assist hook and it just slides down on top of it. Um, 
anytime you add anything like this to your assist hook, it adds to the action or actually takes away from the action of your jig. So think about it like a parachute. So I brought two different size squids to show you. Um, the smaller the squid, the better in my opinion. But if it's a super calm day, your drift is nice and slow and you can maintain that vertical presentation, um, you can go a little bigger. Th this may actually give you a little bit more of a bite. Um, you know, so you take, you take a jig like this and you add that squid to it. As you're jigging it, you have the motion of the jig, plus you have this little squid going up and down. It may look like a two for one uh, or a smaller, you know, more injured um, bait. Um, but sometimes, so, sometimes this helps out a lot, especially like I say, when it's really calm, the, the current slow, the drift is slow, and you can maintain that vertical presentation. If this works as a parachute on the way down and it makes your angle go out when you're drifting, take it off. Don't, don't mess with it because it's going to kill your ability to stay vertical. And that's, that's critical to doing jigging style stuff. Um, it's not as critical to the squid I showed you earlier. That can go out because it's not, it's not going up and down vertically in the column. It's just kind of bouncing around. And so it can get a lot more line angle on it. Yeah, man. I mean, you, you explained that well. I definitely followed. There was like a hot second one. I wasn't sure about the parachute effect. But then, but then you got it. You deliver that message. I get it. Where it's just not going to drop the way you want it to drop. And if the game is straight up and down, then you need it to drop. I, I mean, I think you did a great job describing it. Yeah, vertical jigging is literally it, the more vertical you can keep it, the more fish you're going to catch. Because there's nothing about this piece of lead, or any of these pieces of lead, that has any attraction ability other than the action you give it from your rod. Okay. And I've talked, uh, you know, a lot about jigging in the past, and it's a system. So you kind of have to know the system. It's it's not just tying it on any rod and, you know, shaking it around and making it work. It, you have to have a system to make this this technique work. Um, but again, this doesn't smell like anything, and and on its own, I mean, it's pretty, but it really doesn't. You know, I don't know that that would attract them on its own. You have to impart the action to the jig itself, and vertical is the game. Now non-vertical presentation bucktail okay again they eat a lot of different kinds of food bucktails are great because they mimic all different kinds of food if i want it to look like a squid um you know i can use a all white one or a glow one or a red one squid change in dark colors a lot um or i can use really bright fancy ones like this chartreuse one or a hot pink one uh, or a glow in the dark color one and i like to use them two ways and this is not a vertical presentation. I want to be as vertical as possible when I when I throw it out. And a lot of times if I'm drifting, I'll pitch it forward from the back or the front of the boat, just forward a little bit so that as it goes down, by the time it reaches the bottom, it's kind of vertical. And then I'll work it as the line goes out away from me. I'll work it kind of up through the column, work it all the way up, drop it, or you know, cast it out and do it again. And so I use them two different ways. This one has a blade on the back, okay? Um, again, this is a, just for example, this is a blue water candy, um, um, head, call it a grin and Gus. Um, it's a three ounce, um, head. Um, and the shape of it is, is, you know, very fast sinking. Again, you want to stay down near the bottom. So any advantage to keep you down near the bottom, you want to be able to use that. So a big round bucktail with big eyes, you know, probably wouldn't work as well as, as more streamlined like this. Um, the blade um, gives you vibration and it gives you a uh, flash. Like this one is chartreuse, so it just adds some color. Um, but it doesn't impede the, the rate of sink. Um, being a willow leaf blade like that, you can pitch it out. It, the blade spins real fast, and as it goes down, um, when it hits the bottom, it's just kind of down there banging around. As you lift it, it kind of vibrates up and vibrates down. Um, and then I also use... Um, and, and this is just, I just grabbed this pack because I was using them the other day. Um, six to eight inch grub tails. Um, and you'll use that on the back of this um, bucktail as well. Um, this is a gulp. It adds some smell. Um, sometimes that's important. Sometimes it doesn't matter. You know, again, these fish are, I, as much as I love catching African pompanos, um, they have frustrated me more times than, than I can tell you because I know they're there. I can see them. Um, I caught them the day before or 
the moon phase changed while we were fishing or the current changed or something changed and they stopped biting. Um, and I know they're there. I'm looking at them. Um, getting them to eat is definitely going to be your, your biggest challenge after finding them. But finding them, again, is hard. Um, but because they're so uh, finicky on, uh, you know, certain things, eating low, high, I, I've showed you these baits. What I really want to tell you is focus yourself on who hooked up and where they were in the column. For me, as a captain, <clears throat> I have to watch a lot of different things going on at once. Um, so I'm, I'm trying my best to take care of everybody's needs and watch where everybody was. Um, because a lot of times, you know, people that don't go to the to the break a lot, they, they may not know to watch, hey, I got bit as soon as I hit the bottom. Or I got bit as my line angle started to go out and I was up 60, you know, 50, 60 feet. Um, I need to be able to watch that. So as an angler, when you drop it down there, know where in the water column you got bit. Probably the single most important thing to know. The next important thing to know is that I drop it down and he hit it when it was stopped. Like it hit the bottom, I jigged it, I hit the bottom again, and I got bit. Or was I jigging a couple of times and I got hit in mid-stride where I was actually working the lure? Um, I, that is like the second most important thing. Where in the column they are, where they're feeding. Second is, do they want it fast? Do they want it slow? Do they want it dead stick? You know, and this is going to sound crazy to a lot of people, but um, when I was first getting into this Pompano thing where we were targeting them, not as bycatch, because we catch them as bycatch all the time, um, I would be in the bow you know, with a bucktail, for instance, and I would throw it out and it would hit the bottom and somebody would need something or, you know, somebody would hook a fish. And so I would let out enough slack so that the bucktail was on the bottom, shove the rod in the rod holder and go back there and do whatever I needed to do and look up and the rod would just be bent all together. Fish ate it. Nobody's touching the rod. It's in the rod holder. And that happened so much that I routinely walk to the bow, pitch a bucktail out if I can afford to do it with the people in the boat, flip it out, let it hit the bottom give it an extra 10 or 12 feet, flip the bale, stick it in the rod holder, and let the boat, natural motion of the boat, work that, that uh, bucktail. Um, some days, that's the only rod that'll get bit, and you have to force your anglers to drop the bait down and literally point the rod at the ocean and just hold on, and you're feeling for a little tick. Days like that, I, I feel like they're, they're coming up and they're sucking, but they're not sucking real hard, so they don't get a whole lot of the, the hook in their mouth, and um, those are the frustrating days because I can actually watch a fish bite a jig and the angler not know it happened because it's so subtle. Um, and, and sometimes when they eat, if they come down and, they, sw and they, they go to suck at it, they're pushing it with their nose. So it actually lifts the jig up. So instead of it being a hit where it goes down, it's a hit where you actually feel a little light pressure. The pressure comes off the jig and then it comes back down. That's a bite. And, and you need to be able to recognize that because the way to hook that fish as you feel that, you start cranking, the rod kind of loads up, and then you set the hook. It's not trying to set the hook and take all that slack out before you come tight. Okay. Man, uh, I mean, I am fully – this is an educational experience, man. I am processing a lot. Like, uh, you can tell – I'm going to say you're warmed up from the Moorhead Saltwater Fishing School, and you're hitting stride with, with, with preaching, with educating. You know, yes. I mean – I mean, this in, this podcast so far is full of information. I mean, you even took away my thing. Hey, man, any final thoughts? I mean, you you did it succinctly and said, "All right, here's the two main the two main takeaways." You know, like, I love it, man. I mean, you made my hundredth podcast episode as easy as it could be. I mean, well, Billy shouldn't pay me as much as he normally does for a podcast episode. I, I'm going to say one more thing about the fight too, because these fish, because of their shape, they, they fight all different kinds of crazy ways, and so. Me in general, people in general, get used to catching something and, and the way it fights. And you go, okay, that's not this or it's not that. A pompano will fool you. I have set the hook or watched my clients set the hook on pompanos. And they literally burn line out like a tuna or a wahoo would. And everybody on the boat's like, oh, well, that's not a pompano. And sometimes a pompano will take a bite, you know, get a hook up, and he'll take off and he'll burn 40, 50, 60 yards off. And the line angle will come up, and he'll fight up there, but because of their shape, 
as the fight progresses, the, the line angle will come back down, and they almost always spiral on the way up, okay? This is a problem that you need to know going into pompano fishing. Because they spiral on the way up, and I'm talking about like 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not up and down when you fight them, they're sideways. And so they're going around in a circle like this. The line angle from your hook changes in his mouth as that fish circles around, right? So be real cautious at the end stage of the fight. You're fighting that fish. He's doing your circles. You feel him doing those circles where the, where the rods kind of change in direction. Crank down, lift gently, crank down, lift gently. Don't pump hard. And if he, if you're cranking him up and you're cranking down and lifting and he takes off and goes to run, point the rod, kind of like, like tarpon fishing. Point the rod. Let him surge because you don't know where that angle of the hook is in his jaw. And so – as he's circling around, he's, he's, he's making that hole bigger or he's tearing the skin on his, on his lips away. Um, that's one scenario where they run off. Sometimes um, they do this crazy fight where you set the hook and they go to the bow. And then they go around the bow and then they go around the stern and you catch them. You wind up catching them where you started or you hook up and they go to the bow and then they go back to the bow, stern and they go back to the bow. Um, but they always end up spiraling up. Okay. Um, so just it, when you're, when you're pompano jigging, um, don't assume it's not a pompano because of the way it fights. Cause they're all different. And, and even in the same, like Monday we had, we had two fish that took off, just hauled, you know, hauled line off and fought crazy. All the rest of them fought straight up and down. And we pulled off a ton of fish on Monday because they were just barely skin hooked. So in that case where if you're hooking a bunch of fish and you're, and you're losing them, um, during the fight. Um, my suggestion to that is downsize hooks. Sounds crazy. Um, but like, for instance, if you look at these two hooks real quick, if you look at these two hooks real quick, the gauge wire on this hook is almost twice what the gauge wire on this one is. If you look at the thickness of the wire itself, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the key is this, if I'm getting, if I'm getting bites, but I'm losing them, I'll change from this heavy hook to this lighter hook because as he goes to suck on that, that jig to get it, you know, to, to bite it, this hook weighs less. It may go a little deeper into his throat uh, or into his jaw. Um, and then down, and I even down, I didn't put them on the table, but I even downscale the size of the hook. Um, short shank, little, you know, heavy offshore style hooks, live bait style hooks or what we're using, but downgrade the gauge of the steel so that it's as light as possible. So when he goes to eat it, it goes as deep in his mouth as possible. All right, man, Rick Croson, that was an African Pompano education. I like him a little bit. You know, if you haven't been able to tell, I like him a little bit. Yeah, man. I mean, even off the bat, like I, I was impressed off the gate, you know, just your understanding of the fish, its characteristics, its habits, like, and it makes sense to me. I mean, going offshore is a big investment of time, money, gas, equipment. And why would you not want to be? as prepared as possible to make that much of an effort to try to catch a fish. It makes little to no sense not to have every tool in your box, including, you know, information, information is King, man. So good for you, man. Again, I thoroughly enjoyed this, man. I'm, my brain is full. My brain is full of African Pompano. Thank you so much, Gary. I, I'm from my heart. I am privileged uh, I, to, to know you and to be friends with you. But uh, thank you guys so much for just having this, uh, this information that we can share to people. Um, it's an amazing platform. And uh, just thank you again for doing it. You got it, man. You're a great ambassador and appreciate the relationship right back at you, man. Looking, already looking forward to next time and, you know, hoping it comes sooner than later. Thank you, sir. Later, Rick. Billy, what about it, man? What about Billy's best takeaway? Like, you know, take your pick. Like, I, you know, I really am. Right? My brain is full. Like I was yeah. hanging on everything. I really wanted to process it. I wanted to retain it. You know, he, he was very giving of information. What, what resonated with you? Yeah, man. I mean, there's, uh, there's so many things, you know, one thing that I, I like is I like when people tell me, and I've been on a boat with Rick, so, and he's really good at giving instruction of how to do something. And so one thing he said is jigs don't, catch fish like the system that makes them work like you got to figure out the system 
And really what I got out of this is between nitro bladders, designing a jig, uh, sardines have higher fat, uh, smaller squid, the better. Like, we're not really talking to a boat captain here. We're talking to a scientist, Gary. Like, this dude is, like, dialed in. And that's what I, you know, I'm just sitting here like, man, what a... I just like to see people love their craft, you know. And so this guy is freaking dialed. I mean, freaking dialed in. Couldn't ask for a better 100 episode. And if you didn't learn anything about Pompano fishing, you just didn't listen. <laughs> like, just listen to the show again or watch it again. So, uh, dude, it's pretty, pretty sick. Yeah, man. I'm, I am, and you know, I do get to fish with a lot of people, and I, there are those times where you're just inspired. You know, the way I've described it. I've used the scientist, but I've said it's like half artistry, half scientist. So they're half artist, half scientist, and it's just such a cool marriage, and yeah. uh, and and it produces, and, you know, it produces in many ways. So yeah, I think you're, awesome, I think man. you're on to it. I think you nailed that. Might be your best summation of Billy's best takeaway. I mean, all those notes. I had no idea you were taking all those notes. Dude, I was, here I thought I was taking you were looking at TikTok videos on your phone while Rick was talking. Yeah. But look at you. You know what, Gary, speaking of, as the <laughs> producer of this show, I can see everyone's cameras at all times, and I've never seen you just kind of sit back and, I mean, you weren't even close to your microphone. You just rolled back in your chair, you leaned back, you're listening, and it was really like you're enjoying it. So that was pretty cool. And yeah, you're right. You're only going to get paid half of uh, <laughs> what you normally get paid. So. Uh, all wait right. a second. My best takeaway <laughs> is you can you see me all the time, even when I'm not on screen. That's the takeaway. Oh. I see what you're doing when you think no one is. You're <laughs> sick, sick man, Gary. No, I'm just messing. <laughs> oh man, too much fun, dude. This is great, man. Love it. We made it to episode 100. And if people, you know, and most people probably don't care about podcasting, but most podcasts don't make it past episode seven. 10 if they're lucky so to get to 100 and have the great sport we do from our sponsors from our community from the captains that come on the show um man it's it's cool it's a big thing so i'm proud and you should be as well gary so appreciate you man i tell you what man i'm feeling the love so i'm gonna give you a shout out like you made this happen man i resisted the podcast gary we should do a podcast i'm too busy gary we should do a podcast i'm too busy COVID hits gary we should do a podcast God damn it. COVID did hit. I'm not busy. All right, let's do a podcast. And here we are a hundred episodes later, man. Yeah. Enjoying the ride and looking at looking ahead. And again, we'll do a little plug here at the end, looking ahead for the podcast. Clearly it's resonating with the fishing community, all kinds of, you know, reasons to continue. And not only that, but it gave us inspiration to start a new project, the weekly fishing report starting in April delivered in video and audio form, not in the newspaper. You won't see it in print. And, uh, you know, looking forward to finding our rhythm with that project as well, man. Yeah, man. It's going to be awesome. And thanks once again to our sponsors, Marine Warehouse Center, been with us most of the time, and then also Bland Landscaping Co. for this episode. Appreciate you all. And to all, a good night fishing, <laughs> whatever you're doing. <laughs> anyway, I'm out of here. See you, Gary. See you in the next one. Fishing,